All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Nerd of the Rings. It's been a while since we've had uh, a live stream with just me. So uh, it's good to have you guys here in the chat. I see there's been a lot of chatter already. Uh, a lot of people congratulating me on 200,000 subscribers. Thank you so much uh, to each and every one of you who's watched videos on the channel and uh, subscribed, obviously, and shared videos. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. It's been a crazy ride. Um, it was just a year ago in January that I started this channel. So um, here we are 15 months later and at 200,000 subscribers. So that's pretty amazing. Um, so thank you. I'm so glad that you guys are enjoying the videos. And I look forward to uh, the channel growing some more and uh, being able to do some cool new things with the channel in the future. Um, so yeah, we're going to have some open Q&A here. Um, I wanted to obviously announce officially here on the channel um, the uh, giveaway that I'm doing. I kind of missed out on really celebrating the 100K milestone. Uh, we had some interviews around that time, and it was kind of a busy time for me personally. So um, yeah, we didn't didn't really have as much of a chance to, to celebrate it um, with you all. So um, I wanted to make up for it, so I'm giving away some pretty cool items, um, pretty awesome items here. So we've got first prize is the 4K edition of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, um, and who wouldn't want that, right? I've got a copy of it right here. I reviewed it a while back. It is awesome. I love watching this in 4K. Um, I, yeah, it really renewed my vigor for, um, watching these movies countless times, um, in this whole new way. So, so that's first prize. Um, second prize, we've got a copy of the new illustrated Silmarillion, uh, illustrated by Ted Naismith. And if you're not familiar with Ted Naismith, you need to get familiar with him because his work is amazing. Um, I'm a huge fan of Ted Naismith, and I know Alan Lee and John Howe, also both amazing, um, are a little probably more well known to uh, more casual fans because they're they were involved with the films, so people know him from that. Um, but Ted Naismith is right up there with my absolute favorite uh, Tolkien artist. He might he might actually be my my number one favorite. So um, so we've got that for prize number two. Prize number three, we have an illustrated edition of Unfinished Tales, which also illustrated by Ted Naismith, as well as the previously mentioned Alan Lee and John Howe. So you've got all three. This is like the holy trinity of Tolkien illustrators all worked on, on this particular book. So a couple gorgeous uh, books and the 4K trilogy. Can't go wrong with that. So all you have to do to enter, go to the description. There is a uh, link there. It's all free. It doesn't cost you anything to do any of these uh, these check boxes to uh, to get yourself entries. I think there's something like 70 possible entries that you can get yourself by just doing things like visiting my YouTube channel. I'm on Twitch now. Um, this is actually my first stream on Twitch, so I hope that's going okay. Hello to anyone who's from Twitch. So far, all the comments are YouTube, but that's to be expected. <laughs> so hopefully, if you're watching this on Twitch, um, you know, put a comment there so I know that it's actually doing something. Um, but yeah, so I, I did start a Twitch if you haven't. Oh, look. Yeah, we've got a couple there. Thank you. We've got a couple mentioning that it's going OK on Twitch. So that's good. Um, yeah, so I did uh, create a Twitch for the channel as I do more uh, gaming stuff. I'm hoping to do more gaming uh, Lord of the Rings online as well as uh, some of the old school uh classic console games and maybe some shadow of more sh shadow of mordor shadow of war type stuff um i'll probably be doing that a little bit more on twitch than here on the youtube channel um i'll try to keep the youtube channel primarily to lore um and stuff like that so so yeah if you're on twitch check me out over there um all right so i also um if you are a patreon subscriber you're automatically entered into um a prize drawing or, you know, cause I'm not really sure how, uh, lottery rules work here in the United States or anywhere for that matter. Um, so yeah, if, if you're a Patreon supporter, you are automatically 
entered into a drawing for a particular price that um that I won't name. You know, we won't talk much about it, but it's probably pretty awesome. Um, so if you're on the fence and you've been thinking about uh, supporting on Patreon, um, now's a good time to do it. So, um, all right. We're getting a lot of comments coming in here. The name of the Twitch channel is Nerd of the Rings. I think the username might be Nerd of the Rings 1 because I think Nerd of the Rings was taken. So you can switch. Yeah. Check for... <laughs> Check for that. I should know this information off the top of my head. Apologies. Oh, we got already got our first super chat. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'll get to that in just a minute. So first thing I'm going to do, because I know it's why a lot of you are excited to be here, is I'm going to give you the first bonus code for the giveaway. So this is worth 10 entries, which is a pretty good percentage of the to total overall entries. The first bonus code, speak melon. Speak melon. So there you go. That will get you 10 bonus entries into the giveaway. And I've got another bonus code that'll give you another 10 that I'm going to do at the end of the live stream. So stick around for that. Um, yeah, so speak melon, get you a little bit of uh, Doors of Durin secret code action going on. All right, let's get to Ryan's super chat. So Ryan asks, are you concerned about the upcoming Amazon Lord of the Rings series? I hope it's true to Tolkien. Um, so I've gotten this question a lot. Um, and my philosophy on it is I'm not going to worry too much about it until I have stuff to go off of. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we, we haven't even seen a trailer yet. So, um, yeah, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to freak out about it. You know, I, I think the most riled up I got was when there was rumors that it was going to be Game of Thrones-esque with like nudity and stuff. And I was definitely not on board for that. Um, so, I mean, I will totally call out, you know, if I think, um, you know, there's, there's things that they're doing that are blatantly, you know, uh, disrespectful to Tolkien's world. Um, I'll totally call those out, but, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, freak out about it before we even see a trailer or even stills. Like we don't even have pictures. Like so far we've just pretty much uh, been going off of, um, you know, fan art, like taking other pictures of these actors and like Photoshopping them into shots of like Kate Blanchett as Galadriel and stuff. So, I mean, we don't, we don't have much to go off of. So, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry too much about it. Let's see here. Let's see if there's any. Oh, we still got the bonus code up there. Yeah, so bonus code if you missed it. Speak Melon. I'm gonna look up the Twitch uh, username so I can let you guys know exactly what it is. Here. Yeah, Nerd of the Rings One is the username. There you go. I can even see myself talking about being on Twitch while on Twitch. Pretty cool. Um, another question, what is the best book of Middle Earth for you? Um, hmm. I think this depends on the day, which, uh, which one I would say is my favorite. I'm guessing that that's kind of what you're going for there was which one is my favorite. Um, I really... The Hobbit is kind of hard to beat for me. I like, you know, it's it's so different from everything else. Um, it's so whimsical that, like, if it's just on a given day where I just want to read something fun in Middle Earth, I'll read The Hobbit. I really like Bilbo. Um, yeah, he's a pretty awesome character. Um, yeah, other than that, like, Lord of the Rings is kind of the standard answer because it's, it's so classic. Um, but kind of my... Um, my I wouldn't say guilty pleasure because it's it's awesome. So it's not like a uh, a shame to <laughs> to be a fan of it. But Children of Huron, I think, doesn't get the attention it deserves. Um, I th I think uh, it's right up there with with Lord of the Rings, and it's a little it's it's more easily readable, I think, than Silmarillion. Silmarillion can get kind of dense and 
Um, you can kind of get bogged down by all the names and places. Um, whereas Children of Horan is much more similar to Lord of the Rings and uh, a more free flowing narrative story. So, so there you go. So there's three answers for your question um, that had one answer. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see here. Ben asks, hey, Matt, congrats on the channel. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Silmarillion really question here. Do you know if we get any specifics about what is sung into being in the first two themes of Iluvatar? We know the children are in the third. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I would guess everything that's not the children perhaps i don't know um i don't know if it if if it says honestly um i'd have to research into that because yeah i i'm kind of revealing how much research i have to do on a weekly basis i definitely you know people say all the time like you know so much well i research so much <laughs> every week um which most of it sinks in which is why you know that helps me choose what uh um topics i do it, part of it is uh, is what I want to learn about, honestly. All right. We got another super chat from Matt. Thank you, Matt. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, but I've never read the books. I love the lore and history. In what order should I read the works of J.R.R. Tolkien? That is an amazing question, Matt. And I actually, just in case this question came up, I actually got my graphic here of my recommended reading order, just in case someone asked this, because I get asked this quite a lot. Um, so basically, my reading order that I recommend is in order of complexity, what I feel like is order of complexity. The Hobbit, it's a children's book, by far the easiest. Lord of the Rings is the natural next point. Um, you've got some of the same characters. Um, yeah, the obvious, those are obvious one and two from there. I actually recommend children of Hurin next. Um, because like I said, I feel like it's a little easier of a read than Silmarillion. It's less dense, fewer characters, and, uh, it's just a single story, self-contained story. From there you go to Silmarillion, which is kind of a collection of stories, unfinished tales. You start getting into the more, um, academic approach in a sense because you've got sections of story as well as sections of commentary by Christopher Tolkien about his father's works. Um, but you've got some really good unfinished in unfinished tales. You've got some really good stuff like um, that's where a lot of uh, the Numenor story happens and you get some of Gandalf and Galadriel um, or the Astari in general, not just Gandalf, um, and then some history of Galadriel as well. Um, so you've got a lot of a lot of stuff there um, in an Unfinished Tales, and then Baron and Luthien that presents multiple versions of how that uh, that story developed. Same with Fall of Gondolin, and then if you're really just you want to go with the full shebang, you go to History of Middle Earth, which is as academic as you get with uh, with Tolkien's works. So there you go. That's the full, full lineup for you. Um, which is your favorite Middle Earth movie, though? Asks G Dogcracker underscore N. Um, see, I I change a lot on this question as well. Um, so I. <laughs> I can justify an answer to all of them. I will say that anytime someone asks me my favorite movie, I do not break them up. I just say The Lord of the Rings because I consider it one full story. It's like one full film. Like I would rather, I can tell you I would rather watch 12 hours of Lord of the Rings than four hours of the Snyder Cut. But that's just me. I'm not trying to ruffle any feathers. I just really like Lord of the Rings. Um, so Fellowship is awesome because... All your main characters are together for most of the film. Um, it's a perfect introduction to the world. They do a fantastic job. Everything from the prologue to the clear end of Fellowship, it's just straight awesome. Um, Two Towers, I feel like, um, I feel like Helm's Deep as a whole is the best battle in the series. Um, not necessarily the best moments, 
but the best battle from start to finish. Um, and then I feel like it has the most, uh, the ending of Two Towers. I, I love the ending, the way the theatrical version of Two Towers wraps up with Sam and you've got Gandalf setting the stage talking about, you know, now Sauron's wrath will be terrible, his retribution swift. And then you've got the open-endedness of like, what is Gollum up to? He's going to try to double cross him somehow. And yeah, it's just a great, great way to end and get people amped for the third movie. And then the third movie, you've got the payoff to the whole thing. And it's just everything that you've built up. You know, they did such a good job of building up all the characters. So then by the third one, you're just along for the ride. Um, so yeah, all I can say is it, it changes depending on the day, honestly. <laughs> um, all right, let's see here. Uh, ba -ba -ba. This is an interesting question. Uh, what percentage of The Hobbit is real and actually canon, and what percentage of it is Bilbo making up nonsense to sound more impressive, though? Um, that's an interesting... That's an interesting question. I do, I do like the idea that you know Bilbo is embellishing a little bit. I, I honestly, I think that would have been a really cool way to take the films. Um, you know, if if instead of the bookends being Bilbo, you know, writing in his study, which was fine. Um, I mean, it was it was cool to see Ian Holm again, but uh, I would have rather seen you know Ian Holm. Uh, you know, and obviously there's an age difference where it was a little hard to, to, you know, make him look like 50 year old Bilbo. But, uh, um, I think, uh, like seeing him telling the story to young hobbits <laughs> would have been a really cool way to do it with his voiceover, um, popping in every once in a while. And then like, I don't know, maybe he even gets called out by, uh, um, some of the hobbits on like. I, the, like the wereworms, like that would have been if if there would have been a thing after the wereworms where like Bilbo gets called out and it's like, oh, yeah, no, there weren't wereworms. I was making that up. Then I would have been like, oh, OK, that was funny. Um, but yeah, wereworms, man, I'm not a big fan of wereworms. All right. Andrew <laughs> asks, what would you like to see in Amazon's new Lord of the Rings show? Do you think a darker Game of Thrones type of show fits Tolkien's vision? Um, I do not think a Game of Thrones esque Middle Earth fits Tolkien's vision. Um, there's a few reasons for this. Um, you know, for when I think of Game of Thrones, I think of sex and violence. Um, full disclosure, I have watched maybe one episode combined of Game of Thrones. Um, and then I've, I've kind of, I have a friend who watches Game of Thrones, who watched Game of Thrones and they would keep me up to date on the plot lines and stuff. Cause I, I just couldn't get over the, um, excessiveness of it. Honestly, it just wasn't my thing. Um, and that's, that's one thing that I really appreciate about Tolkien and I, I he just doesn't dwell on things. Um, and we talked about this when we had, uh, Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor on, um, you know, he, there is an element of Game of Thrones, you know, when you think about the sexual stuff that, you know, it's there to, you know, for lack of a better term, titillate you, you know, it's there to like get a reaction. Um, and it's gratuitous. Like there's no, no two ways about it. It's definitely gratuitous. Um, and that would be so foreign to Tolkien's world because he never, you know, there is so little sexual anything, you know, even romance, like it's limited. Like you think of like there's Baron and Luthien, there's Faramir and Eowyn, Aragorn and Arwen. And even that they're like, they're very muted. You know, they keep, they keep things that, uh, you know, you would expect the average person to keep private, private to them, <laughs> I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, but yeah, and he, he also, you know, with the violence, he doesn't dwell on the violence, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, you talk about, um, you know, I was just reading about, uh, when Saruman is killed, it's not like he, do, you know, he doesn't go into detail about the blood gushing out and all this stuff. He's, it's just, this is what happens. You know, I, I think, I think there's power in, uh, you know, letting people's own imagination where, you know, seeing 
you know, not seeing excessive violence. I think, yeah, there it's, it's a, a direction I hope they don't go down. We'll say that. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Ah, this is a good one. Um, should, I believe it's Owen and Gloin be, be pronounced with an O-Y sound or an O-N sound? I prefer the latter. Yes, yeah, so proper way to say their names is Owen and Gloin. So I know in the films it said Oin and Gloin, but that is actually not the way um, that Tolkien's works tells us it is pronounced. And if you actually, if in this is even the Andy Serkis version of the audiobook, he pronounces them correctly, even though in the movies he was in, they did not. Um, so yeah, you should listen to audiobooks. That's where most of my, you know, a lot of my pronunciation is based on like audiobooks and audio dramas, um, unless I've discovered in the meantime that uh, those aren't accurate. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, man, <laughs> there's a lot of comments here. I'm trying to keep up. I'll scatter in some super chats and some, uh, some comments as well. Um, Simon Cooper, the Tolkien film ignored his Catholic faith, desp faith, despite how important it was to him. Yet he had, Yet, had he been gay, it would have been the main focus. Your thoughts? Um, okay, so we're talking about the Nicholas Holt uh, biopic here. Um, I was, I wouldn't say disappointed, because um, I, I kind of expected them to gloss over his faith. Um, so I, I guess I wasn't as surprised by it. Um, I was a little bit disappointed because I've read a bit about, you know, his uh, biography and they, um, you know, they kind of set up the, uh, the priest as an antagonist more than he actually was. And, you know, it's, I, yeah, I just, I think it's, it's one of those things, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's unfortunate that they that they didn't have more because you know I think faith is a powerful thing and uh, um, you know it's an important part of people's lives. Um, but we're you know we're kind of kind of in a time where it's not always the popular thing for Hollywood to cover. Um, you know I I I have hopeful expectations that um, there's a, an adaptation or a uh, biopic of C.S. Lewis um, that'll feature Tolkien in it coming out. I can't remember what it's called, um, but I'm very curious to see what they do with that um, because it's actually Tolkien who brought, like, you know, converted Lewis essentially from, uh, from an atheist to a Christian. Um, so I'm kind of curious. I, I would like to see that on film. Um, now you could argue in that that Tolkien film specifically that that you know wasn't the angle they were going for, um, but yeah, I mean it is what it is. I, you know, we could we could hypothesize all day, but I think that would probably be a better question for the filmmakers. Um, yeah, that's that's it is it is what what they made it, and I have I have no idea why they made make the decisions they do. Um, yeah. All right. Movie Return of the King did Faramir slash Eowyn dirty. One of my favorite romances from the books. The chapter of their relationship in the book is so wholesome and lovely. Yeah, um, I would totally agree. Honestly, uh, Faramir in general um, was kind of, you know, changed a lot for the for the adaptation. Um, trying to find it here. Yeah, so we have this uh, this behind the scenes um, picture that was shared by Miranda Otto, and this is these are different outfits than what they're wearing in the at the end of the Return of the King. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, because Faramir has ar uh, has armor at the end of the Return of the King, as you can see. Um, but yeah, this is this is from uh, their wedding. Apparently, they filmed a wedding scene for Faramir and 
uh, Eowyn. So I'm hoping they get that. I, I love uh, Faramir and Eowyn. They're awesome. That's why I did, I did like, it's over a year ago now, but I did a Valentine's, like, couples ranking video, and I put Faramir and Eowyn number one. A lot of people really liked it. A lot of people really didn't. So um, let's see here. Stefan says, just want to say I love the channel. Keep it up. Thank you so much. Um, let's see here. So I did want, I, I do have a couple of announcements. Um, I'll work in between uh, questions here. Um, so I've had a couple people ask um, because I mentioned previously that I'll be um, posting an interview I did with Brian Sibley. And if you aren't familiar with Brian Sibley, um, he was actually the writer of the 1981 BBC radio drama of Lord of the Rings. And it is awesome. Um, it's one of my favorite adaptations, actually, of Lord of the Rings. Um, I've heard people say that, you know, they find it to be more faithful than the films. It's kind of, I feel like it's kind of hard to compare the two mediums. But, um, yeah, they're both, I mean, they're both amazing. Um, it's one of those things it's on audible um if you want to check it out or you know listen to clips of it on youtube um to hear for yourself but it's amazing how and i bring this up in the interview um so i'll be posting that interview next week to answer the question that's been asked um but it's amazing how many of the characters sound like their movie counterparts from the peter jackson adaptations um yeah there, there's just so many i think Arguably, the one that sounds the least like his movie counterpart is Ian Holm playing Frodo. Um, does not sound like much like Elijah Wood. He sounds like an, an older, more book-accurate Frodo, actually. Um, and then also with that, um, the Nerd of the Rings podcast is now available on most podcast platforms. So what that is right now, all it is is uh, the interviews that I've done here on the channel I've posted those to um, pretty much every major uh, platform, um, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, so search Nerd of the Rings and you should be able to find it on your favorite podcast platform. Um, so if you're in your car or something, you wanna listen to an interview, um, I will tell you the Brian Sibley one, we actually ended up talking for three hours. Um, so it's, it's, I was just having a blast with it. Like it was great picking his brain about it, adapting Middle Earth. It was awesome. Um, all right. Matt Stoker asks, do you have any preference to certain editions in the canon or other books Tolkien adjacent? I'm looking to buy almost all of the canon for my definitive collection. I don't want to miss anything. Um, I don't like, as far as the, the actual text of the books hasn't changed. So, um, aside from the very first edition of The Hobbit, where Gollum voluntarily gives up the ring, nothing changes between like versions of the Silmarillion or anything like that. Um, the ones that I'm giving away as part of the giveaway, I really enjoy because I love illustrated editions of books. Um, so yeah, I would, I would recommend those. Those are awesome. All right. Mr. Grant Wagner says 200,000 subscribers. Well, freaking done, my guy. Bravo. Thank you so much, Grant. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Let's, we're going to take a Twitch question because I haven't, I haven't seen a whole lot of these. Um, All right. Here's a spicy topic. David Day, discuss. Okay. So if you're not familiar... The general online feeling regarding David Day, he's got a bunch of Tolkien reference books. From what I've heard, I've not personally read um, any of his books. So I'm going to keep my comments to a minimum. But so this is just what I've read online. Um, in general, uh, I've heard that he kind of makes assumptions in certain places that aren't don't have uh, a basis in canon and Tolkien's canon. So, um, so yeah, they, uh, you know, in general, uh, I, the, 
long and short of it, what I've heard is like, if you buy his books, appreciate the art and take stuff with a grain of salt, which is not ideal for a, a reference book. Um, so that's why I stick to like Tolkien stuff himself um, with the with a few exceptions. One I've got is the Atlas of Middle Earth, um, which is a great one. Um, I highly recommend that one. But yeah, I, I, I don't personally have a lot of experience with his books, but I know, you know, I've seen examples and stuff of where he's kind of uh, made assumptions uh, like one is, you know, saying I think he, you know, presents it as if it's conclusive that Tom Bombadil is a Maya and it's not. Um, that's just his opinion, but he doesn't present it as his opinion, apparently. So um, oh, where did I get my hat from? I ordered it from Weta. They sell these on their website. And I thought that looks like a pretty cool hat. So uh, yeah, so I got it from Weta. Which was the most emotional moment for you in the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy? That's a good question. Um, so one moment that I really, really like that's ironically not written by Tolkien is when Gandalf and Pippin are discussing death in Minas Tirith when they're pinned down. Um, it's like this, this moment where everything slows down amidst like, you know, two hours worth of battle or whatever it is. And like, it's just such a great moment. And it's one of those moments where, um, you know, if you hadn't been familiar with Tolkien's works beforehand, like I, um, had read the books, but um, even so, I was like kind of surprised, you know, that that this wasn't taken from somewhere else in Tolkien's works because it fits so well with everything Tolkien wrote. And even, you know, we mentioned Tolkien's faith earlier, like it, it fits um, with the, you know, not direct allegory nature of Tolkien's works, but like he takes a little inspiration from his faith um, from time to time. And it, it kind of fits with that. It's just one of those, it's just a beautiful moment where Gandalf comforts him and, you know, says, you know, the journey doesn't end here. And it's just, it's just amazing. It's an amazing moment. Aside from that, you know, obviously the writer, the Rohirrim is amazing. I could watch that like a million times. It was like the first thing I watched when I got the 4k editions. I didn't even start at the beginning of fellowship. I immediately put in return of the King to watch the ride of the Rohirrim. <laughs> Because I love it so much. All right. Let's see here. Man, oh man. Tobias Ball, $10 super chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate the way you blend summary and theories. What if into your YouTube broadcast? Are the theories based on your own analysis or do you research the ideas of others? Um, Let's see here. What have I done so far? So I've done, what if Gandalf took the ring and what if Smaug survived? Um, I think I found a couple ideas online that, you know, theories that other people had said about Gandalf taking the ring. Um, and I didn't so much, you know, t take, cause I, d I, you know, I, f I feel like it's pretty easy to have similar big ideas like what you know if Gandalf takes the ring like you know at some point he's going to be evil he's going to take the ring um so it was more so those you know finding other people's theories where they present the why um or or cite sources within Tolkien's works that give me um help me reshape mine so it's it's not um you know there was times you know I've I've said this on my uh discord chat for my supporters um, you know, I'll, I'll start writing a paper you know, or a script for a theory and I'll get like two pages in and then realize I have to delete the last half page because I find someone else's theory where they point to a specific passage that disproves what I was just thinking would happen. Um, so yeah, so there's, it's, it's a little bit of both. I think in my research, I naturally come across other people's theories. Um, yeah, I don't like just straight up take someone's theory and present it as my own if that's uh, a question or anything. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's good to, you know, get other people's thoughts on it. I know I've I've talked with other Tolkien YouTubers like Men of the West um, about um, 
certain what if scenarios, which is always fun. They're just fun. What if scenarios? I'm I'm working on another one right now. I won't reveal it quite yet because it'll be a little bit before it comes out. But um, but I saw another super chat come on. Um, Chris. Would you considering doing a what if video or podcast of Sauron winning and the host of the Valar coming to help? That would be interesting. I would imagine the Valar. I mean, yeah. See, I naturally just start doing it right now. When you ask me the question, I'm going to start hypothesizing here. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously the Valar took care of Morgoth, but. Um, we should keep in mind that at the end of the first age, the Valar themselves, or at least the most important Valar, were, were kind of, it's kind of implied that they didn't come themselves. It was just the host of the West. So um, it was more like Maiar and elves. Um, so I don't know if the Valar themselves would go or if they would just send a host, that kind of thing. Um, but I would think they could take care of Sauron. You know, they took care of Morgoth. And Sauron doesn't have a force, you know, an army of dragons or Balrogs or anything like that. He's just got orcs, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I might do I might do a similar uh, theory later on for sure. Um, man, oh man. Okay. Uh, super villain, five dollar super chat. Thank you so much. What is more interesting? What if the blue wizards join the War of the Ring? Or what if Elrond chooses his human side instead of Elven side? Um. Hmm. So at first I thought Elrond. That was my first thought, but I think the Blue Wizards would have a bigger. They'd have a bigger impact on the Lord of the Rings story. Um, which we know more about and would, you know, it'd be a little easier to kind of guess what would happen there. Um, if Elrond chooses the human side, then I'm guessing he lives in Numenor with his brother and one of them is the king and one of them is not, <laughs> is the second in line to the throne or whatever. Um, and they both die around the same time and it's just their ancestors, you know, um, I guess you know you could you could take the route. Okay, well then that means Elrond's um, not around in the Second Age. Uh, by the time Sauron is making trouble in Eriador, and he's not he can't find uh, he can't establish Rivendell. Um, but I don't know. Maybe somebody else does. If if he doesn't, you know, it might just be the next next elf up in that situation. Um, the Blue Wizards, though, joining the War of the Ring. I mean, they were. Involved so in Tolkien's later writings, he said, um, you know, due to the actions of the blue wizards, the east did not outnumber the west in the War of the Ring, otherwise, they would have. So that leads me to believe, and this very well could come up in the Amazon show, that uh, the blue wizards were leading groups of uh, you know, uh. Easterlings who are not faithful to Sauron um, against possibly against those who were faithful to Sauron. Maybe there's a civil war happening in the lands of Rune at the same time as the War of the Ring um, or even before, you know, who knows? Who knows what that means? But um, but yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thought. Like, could you imagine the Blue Wizards like leading a group of. Uh, um Easterlings who oppose Sauron and they end up showing up at the Black Gate or showing up at Minas Tirith to help out. Um, yeah, it'd be kind of crazy. It'd be one of those like, it's kind of a bonker scenario, but I'd totally watch it, even though, you know, it's obviously not what transpired, but it would be interesting for sure. All right. Rust Echo says, Hello, nerd. It's 20. Two till 20 in Scotland. Love you here. Well, we love you here in the U.S. We love you guys in Scotland. Um, 22 till 20. So that would be, what is that, like 8 o'clock at night? 22 till 20. I'm not good with military time. 
Uh, ba -ba -ba. All right. I do have a question from, from Discord. So one of the other perks, if you are, if you're a Patreon supporter, you get access to uh, my Discord server. Um, and, or if you're a supporter here on YouTube as well, which, the, so those just FYI, those tiers are as cheap as 99 cents a month. Um, but you also, if you're on the Discord server, um, you get your questions uh, read out guaranteed on live streams such as this, where I'm just chatting with y'all. So Allison asks, how did you learn all the voices? Was this a talent you have, or did you need a lot of practice? Um, I wouldn't go as, <laughs> I don't know. I'm a little self-conscious about my voices and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I've always been kind of uh, a little goofy with my voice um, and just kind of like slip into impressions. Just, you know, I, I don't, you know, around family and friends, I'm not shy about it at all. Like I'll just slip into a character. If I'm saying like a movie quote or something, I'll just, just up and do it. Um, so yeah, I, I've kind of had practice in that way. Not, not in a, uh, intentional, like I want to develop my voices kind of thing. It's more just like, I'm kind of a goofball and I like movies a lot and memorize a lot of dialogue from movies. So yeah, <laughs> this is actually, so this will, Let's see here. See if I can pull up. Oh, no. There's someone who, who had a really good comment towards the beginning that was uh, referencing the um, the lines of dialogue with, with Melkor. Um, sorry, I was trying to find it here. I think it was from pre when I started. Um, but yeah, the, the lines of dialogue between Melkor and Hurin when he's like, um, wheresoever they go, evil shall arise, that kind of thing. Um, but he said like, wheresoever you go, nerds shall arise and stuff like that. It was really, it was a clever, clever use, but, um, yeah, but that was a, an excuse for me to use my Morgoth voice. I feel like I do evil guys a little bit better, That gravelly Morgoth. Yeah. And Smaug get a little, you know, bulkier. You've got more mass to you. So you're like, uh. <clears throat> You're like barrel rider, that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know. It's just fun to goof around. Like I never understood why you know people get you know whatever about doing voices. Like you know, if I'm reading to my kids, I'm gonna do voices. You know, if you read the books, you should do the voices. It's more fun. Just let go of the embarrassment and just just do it. Let yourself go. If you want to practice, if you want to do voices yourself, find a time, find a quiet space in your house and just do it with yourself. Like you don't even have to, uh, yeah, you don't even uh, have to do it in front of a crowd or even in front of your kids. You can practice all by yourself. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I see a lot of comments on Twitch. Hello, my fellow hobbits just became a subscriber. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly Smell93. All right. Well, this is a good question. So Alan Hilburn says, it was stated that Gandalf was the only wizard to remain true to his original mission. Why? It seems the blue wizards were working along the same lines in the East. So this is another thing. So, um, this is a tricky area with with Tolkien because when he said Gandalf is the only one to remain true to his mission, he said that earlier in his life than when he later writes that the Blue Wizards, you know, helped ensure victory for the West. So it seems like over time, you know, as uh, Tolkien got older, like the Blue Wizard stuff was some of the last writings he ever did. Um, it seems like he he kind of softened his stance on that a little bit. And so he might have, you know, I don't know, he he may have done the same for Radagast and said, you know, like it wasn't, you know, he he wasn't as productive as Gandalf, I guess. Um, but he certainly didn't fall like Saruman. 
Um, so yeah, who who knows? Um, yeah, I I would say you know part of it is you just have to look at the times when he said that. So it adds a a complicated um, nature to to researching for sure. You kind of have to take take the whole picture um, when you're looking at statements like that. But yeah, I think I think his stance kind of softened on that. All right. If you could choose any land in Middle Earth, which would it be? If I could choose any land, this question's from Jamie. Um, am I owning the land or am I living in the land? No. Um, let's see here. I've had this question. I think, where did I land on this? I think the Shire is pretty appealing. I'm a country boy. I was born i was well i wasn't born on a farm i was raised <laughs> i lived on a farm growing up there we go i wasn't born on the farm um but i grew up on a farm and so i enjoy having space around me like the idea of living you know in uh like i, I see like uh you know in big cities where the houses are like right on top of each other that would drive me insane so yeah, so the Shire is definitely appealing for that aspect. Um, Rivendell, I feel like, is an easy answer because it's so um, awesome and angelic and everything. Um, yeah, I I would want you know my answer for like where I would want to visit is always somewhere dwarven like Casa Doom because I like the dwarves. Dwarves are awesome. All right. Okay, so this is a good question. So if you've become a member um, here on YouTube, you can actually go to the community tab and maybe I'll post it again after this, but there's a link in the community tab that only members can see with a link that you can click on to join the Discord. Um, so you might have to scroll down a bit. I need to post it again there to just bump it. But yeah, so for uh, kick knob, if you go to the community um, tab, you'll be able to find it. Do you think we'll see the blue blue wizards in the Amazon show? I I would almost guarantee that we will. I think you know they've made clear that they're going to cover the extremes of the map, so we're going to see the east and the south. And I think, excuse me, if if we see the east, we're going to see the blue wizards. You know, Gandalf is one of the most popular characters. And if you have the opportunity to have two of his order in the show, um, I don't see that they would pass that up. All right. Sorry, my scrolling kind of messes up from time to time. If you've been on my live streams before, you know the scrolling thing in YouTube. It kind of gets dicey sometimes. All right, here's a good hypothetical question. Oh, this is from Twitch. It's kind of fun to see different uh, sites here. Not used to seeing Twitch on here, so this is fun. Um, Volt Twitch asks, if Gandalf did die to the Balrog and Moria, do you think they still could have won the War of the Ring? Um, well, he did die. But then he got sent back. So I'm guessing, like, if he didn't get sent back, could they have won? That, I think, I think I could make a whole video on that, and I would research the heck out of it. Um, because if you don't have Gandalf, then you likely don't free Theoden, and then Rohan would fall to Saruman. And like, this is where my research would have to kick in because I'm, you know, just off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure there's no other way, you know, because Gandalf's the one who, who cures Theoden of the poison and everything that, uh, that, uh, worm tongue has been feeding him. And yeah, I don't think, you know, Aragorn, even if Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli make their way to Edoras, I don't think, you know, there's no way they they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, 
so yeah, I think, and then if they, if they stay and fight with Rohan, um, then maybe they die there too. And then Minas Tirith falls. Like, it's hard to say, but it, nothing good would happen. So no, I don't, I think, I think, uh, Gandalf coming back is pretty, pretty imperative there. All right, so we're clearing up some uh, some wizard stuff here. This is good. All right, Kev asks, I thought the Astari didn't arrive in Middle-earth until the Third Age. Wouldn't this mean that they won't appear in the Amazon show? So this is where Tolkien's earlier and later writings uh, contradict one another. So I tend to go with his later writings because I figure you know that's more of what he intended if he wrote it later. Um, so in his earlier writings, they all show up around 1000 of the third age. But in his later writings, the blue wizards show up much earlier, like 2,800 years earlier in 1600 of the second age, which is the same time that Glorfindel comes back to middle earth. Um, so yeah. So I think, you know, if, if they're allowed to use the blue wizards from the Tolkien estate, which I think they probably will be, um then i would almost guarantee that they will they will use it okay my twitch name is nerd of the rings one i see that's i'll even type it here for you um nerd of the rings one for everyone okay yeah we don't need to don't need to spam it we've got people who know on here okay Sorry, I'm, <clears throat> yeah, we've got some, okay, we don't need to, yeah, spam these questions. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Time out. It's like my kid's in here. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, N-A-R asks, have you ever played the board game War of the Ring? Because if not, I would highly recommend. So I have purchased it. It's still in the shrink wrap as of right now um, because I'm waiting on um, waiting on a chance to to break it out um, when we have some friends in town that are really big board game people. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I do have it. I'm looking forward to it. I've got War of the Ring, and then I've also got Journeys in Middle Earth um, that are just sitting here waiting to be played. Um, so I'm really excited to to play those whenever I get the chance. Three favorite favorite Valar and why from Bilbo Baggins. Oh, thank you for joining us, Bilbo. You're one of my favorite hobbits. Um, hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna say one is. Varda, she created the stars. And I think it's said that Morgoth, it's either fears her the most or hates her the most. I think it's fears her the most. I think that's right. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a that's definitely one of my top. Um, I like Manwe. You know, that's kind of a easy answer because he's the most powerful, but I, I really like the Eagles. Um, and he helps bring those into being, um, I think, is it Niana? I think is the, uh, the one that, uh, for like sorrow and pity. So that's one of my like low key favorites because it says in the books that that's where Gandalf learns pity from. Um, from Nina. And, you know, I think the pity that's shown over and over in Tolkien's works is something, you know, they did a really good job in the films of uh, the pity of Bilbo when it came to Gollum. Um, and if you either listen to the BBC uh, audio drama or you uh, 
read the books, obviously, um, you discover that during the scouring of the Shire, Frodo shows that same pity. And it's it's a remarkable uh, um, characteristic, you know, to to be able to look somebody who's wrong, look at somebody who's wronged you in terrible ways and still take pity on them and offer them the chance of redemption. It's powerful stuff. All right. Namanja Parlick says, what, what you think did, will Morgoth win if he had the a one ring? I don't know. I kind of feel like in the first age, things are a lot bigger in scale. You know, like, I don't know if the one ring, if that's something powerful enough to move the needle, so to speak. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like Morgoth, you know, he was making dragons. <laughs> you know, he was making an army of dragons and then an army of dragons that could fly. So I don't know if, yeah. And, and it does kind of imply that, you know, um, I guess it says not even and Caligon's fire could destroy the ring. So it's kind of debatable, like what, you know, what is more valuable, but I don't know. I mean, Morgoth, he was just, I feel like he was on another level than Sauron. So, you know, Morgoth's off making an army of dragons. Sauron's making jewelry. You know, it is what it is to each their own. Dan brings into the Valar conversation. Melkor feared Tolkas. In fact, he fleed Valinor before he could be caught by him. Yeah, Tolkas is another one. That's a really good one. I know that's uh, Men of the West's favorite. Yoisten's favorite is, uh, is Tolkas. I do like the fact that he laughs in battle, like that he's just, you know, not fazed. I, I get the feeling he's not fazed by anything. It's like, all right, let's do this. Let's go. So, yeah, I, that is kind of cool. Yeah, it's hard. I, I haven't put a whole lot of thought into my favorite Valar, but yeah, there's stuff to like about all of them, probably. I don't know. I don't know if anybody says Mandos, though. Like, yeah, that's like saying like Hades is your favorite. Um, you know, of the Greek, Greek gods. Yeah. Unless it's in the Hercules adaptation, then maybe, maybe you like that performance, I guess. I don't know. First time I've caught a live stream, found your channel recently. Amazing work. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Welcome to the live stream. Um, so <clears throat> another update for the channel kind of before between uh, open questions here. Um, so on my Patreon, I actually set a goal, uh, a threshold to when I reach this level of support, I start work on a short film. And uh, thanks to the amazing support of my Patreon supporters, we have crossed that goal. So I am now in the scripting phase of a Middle Earth short film. Um, I've actually got two ideas for a short film. Um, that I'm kind of developing each on their own simultaneously. Um, in the end, I hope to make both of them at some point or another, but um, I'm, I'm going to try to see where they go, how they shape up, and which one is more feasible um, to, to produce, you know, based on the budget that it'll take to produce them. And then also, you know, obviously how open things are, you know, how many people were able to have congregate in a single location, that kind of stuff. You know, there's different different scale and technology involved um, with with each idea. So um, it'll just kind of kind of see where where things are budget wise and then also um, just how we are here in the states um, in society, how we're able to, you know, pull off filming and stuff. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of an exciting, uh, exciting uh, upcoming thing uh here it'll be months from now i'm sure these things you know take some time and this is this is all on the side of my full-time stuff so um it'll take some time but i'll be given updates and everything as it goes along and probably post into instagram or whatever so all right ah someone asked about the youtube code okay i'll uh let's see here 
The first code was... Speak Melon was the first code. If you missed it earlier, excuse me. Um, if you missed it earlier, it was Speak Melon. And then I'll have a second code later in the live stream. So stick around. Um, all right. Do you think we'll get more movies from Tolkien's world? I think eventually. Um, it's hard to imagine us never getting any um it might be a while you know depending on how amazon goes like if amazon if the amazon show is amazing i think it could open the door for a lot more um if it's not good it might close the door for a while so there's a lot riding on this even more than just like oh you know this show if it's good then yay we'll have something cool to watch and if it's bad then you know will be disappointed like it could affect you know whether we get more adaptations going forward or not all right what if melkor won ose over to his side hmm that would be interesting cuz you'd kind of have theoretically so ose that's um uh, He's kind of a lord of water, not to the extent of Ulmo, um, because Ulmo is the Vala, but uh, I'll say was a Maya of waters. So, yeah, I don't know. That's interesting because, yeah, you don't really get a sense that Morgoth has much to do with the seas the way the Valar do. Um, yeah, because I like does does Ulmo at that point like go mano a mano with Ase maybe? Yeah, I mean nothing good would happen. We know that. <laughs> like any any of these scenarios where where a good guy becomes a bad guy, it's like well it's not going to result in anything positive, net positive. But yeah, I I mean yeah probably yeah I don't know maybe. Um, I don't know what's whatever the opposite of a Balrog is, since Balrog is shadow and flame, then maybe he'll be shadow and water. That'd be interesting. If there's any artists in here, I would love to see a water Balrog. That would be legit. It could be awesome. It could be terrible. I don't know. But I would love someone to do a rendition. I see Timbo Tuke is in here. He's an artist. Timbo Tuke, thanks for the super chat, man. He's an artist. You should check out his channel. He's basically the Bob Ross of Middle Earth. Um, but yeah, maybe he can make a water Balrog for us. Um, he says, yes, I love fan films. If you need a Hobbit, I think I know someone who could do it. Consider this my first bit of support towards the film. Thanks so much, Timbo. It was actually just recently when Timbo in our, uh, our YouTube group uh, Discord um, mentioned that he wears a wig like i honestly i didn't even think anything of it i thought for sure that it was just your natural hair that you had hobbitish hair but um yeah i hope that's not you know a bombshell to all your viewers to know that you have a wig on but yeah timbo's awesome you should check out his channel super villain thank you for the super chat why is aule so horrible he makes dwarves without permission and has horrible taste in Maiar. Sauron and Saruman. Is Aule a middle child or what? I don't know about the middle child thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, he definitely, I don't know. It depends. Like, did the Maiar, like, did they pick? Did they have a Maiar draft? You know, like if you're playing a pickup game at school and you line all up, the people have your captains and then they pick out the Maiar that they want. Like, if that's the case, then yeah, he had terrible taste. Um, but if it's like they're just assigned by, you know, Iluvatar, then, you know, it's not really his fault, I don't think, unless it's something with the, maybe uh, something about blacksmiths and craftsmen, just, they tend to be rebellious. I mean, you look at Feanor, he was a big time craftsman, and uh, he was a like the greatest smith of all time or whatever. And uh, he kind of 
became a jerk. <laughs> so yeah, maybe it's something with the profession. I don't know. Um, as far as making the dwarves without permission, I really like that storyline. Like it's a really cool storyline of Aule creating the dwarves. Um, it has a very, you know, if you're familiar with uh, Judeo-Christian, um, with, yeah, Christianity or uh, the whole Judeo-Christian um, beliefs, you know, it's it's a lot like um, Abraham and Isaac. Yes. I'm going to blank on this and totally botch it now. Um, but yeah, in his impatience, he has another child and um and then you know they when he when he has his his child that he's his his prized child you know uh god tells him to to sacrifice him and it's kind of very similar to Ale. um he makes the dwarves and then uh eru tells him you know you've got to destroy him and so he does he's getting ready to do it and that's when eru stops him and it's very 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 similar to um yeah to judeo-christian beliefs um but yeah i really like the dwarves i know some people don't but i really like the dwarves so i'm not going to fault him for creating the dwarves personally all right so i want to make sure oh i want to make sure i catch all the super chats in case i've skipped over anyone's oh here we go Quarantino. <laughs> I don't know if that's a uh, translation of the word quarantine, but it's very uh, appropriate for our current times. Um, would you like new movies taking place after Return of the King? Hmm. I would say no, unless unless it's like a uh, an epilogue kind of thing. Um. Not like a full movie, I don't think. Like, there's some cool stuff that happens that's canon after Return of the King, like uh, Aragorn and Eomer teaming up to, um, you know, basically make safe the realms of Gondor and Rohan. Um, but yeah, as far as, like, sequels and theoretical stuff, no, I'm not. I'm not on board for that. Um, I could go on a whole tangent. I've actually, I have like, you know, probably three pages of a script already written <laughs> that I've just kind of left, <laughs> left there because I didn't know, you know, um, if people would enjoy it or not. But um, I, I started doing a whole script on, on why Tolkien was wise for abandoning the new shadow, his abandoned idea for a sequel to Lord of the Rings. And basically what it came down to is when you make a sequel, you steal the happy ending from your beloved characters. Um, you know, in this situation, uh, it was like during the rule of Aragorn's son. Um, you know, it's like one generation later and everything goes to heck. And that's just depressing. And, uh, yeah, like, it, and I, I related it in this, this script that I have in pieces right now. Um, I think I relate it to Star Wars, you know, when, and we won't get into a huge amount of, uh, you know, Star Wars sequels stuff here, because that's not what we're here for. Um, but, you know, that's kind of what I felt with the Star Wars sequels. You know, you kind of robbed Han, Luke, and Leia of their happy ending. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where, when I, when I heard that they were doing those films, I was like, I hope it's worth it, you know, cause you know, they're going to experience some trials. I had a feeling they were going to kill off Han. And I was like, they better make this worth it. Um, and it's debatable. Everyone has their opinion. I would resoundingly say, no, it was not worth taking away the happy ending. Um, but yeah, that, that's the thing is like, you know, to have a compelling story, you have to have things go wrong or things go bad. And, I very much like the uh, um, the idea that it was all gravy after that. You know, they go on like, sure, you know, probably minor things happen, but for the most part, things were good and happy. There's nothing wrong with happily ever after. It's classic. People like it. 
Just leave leave well enough alone. Angel, thank you for the super chat. I would have read off something for you if you want to type anything, but I appreciate the super chat. <laughs> uh, Kim Rudolph, thank you for the super chat. When will you do a watch along of the Russian Lord of the Rings movie with subtitles? Um, so I'm in the process of planning that. Um, I actually reached out to the uh, the channel that posted it. I've not heard back yet. I just emailed them yesterday. Um, and yeah, so I, I wanted to get permission because I wasn't sure as far as like copyright and stuff. Um, but if if we're not able to do a watch along where I actually broadcast it on my screen, what we could always do is sync it up. I could ha have a timer running on my screen and we could watch it together. We just I just wouldn't be broadcasting it from my channel. So. Uh... All right. What do you think would have happened if Thorn Oakenshield didn't die and ruled Erebor by himself? Um, that would have been pretty awesome. I do like Thorin, especially. I, I really liked. Uh, I was gonna say especially Book Thorn, but I like movie Thorn as well. Um, I don't think it would have changed much in terms of Lord of the Rings, honestly. Like I think, I think it would have played out pretty similar from there. Um, yeah, it would have been cool, but like, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting that like the three of the main dwarves that you get used to in the Hobbit die, but then in Lord of the Rings, it's just Boromir is the only <laughs> main character that really dies. It's like, and the Hobbit's a children's book. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it would have changed anything long-term in terms of the lore. I think, you know. It pretty much plays out the same way. Uh, Jacob, thanks so much for the super chat. Hey, bud, congrats on 20, or 20, 2,000, <laughs> 200,000 subscriptions. Looking forward to talking more soon. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jacob. I've got a couple questions that have rolled in from Patreon here. Um, do you have a favorite fan-made film set in Middle Earth? Um, I do, I did really enjoy, uh, the recent, um, I can't remember what it's called. The one on the Aothade. Um, Horn of Gondor. That's what it was. Um, it had some really good choreography and, uh, yeah, it's been a really long time since I've watched the others. Um, so I, there might be some recency bias in that, but yeah, I really liked Horn of Gondor's uh, choreo fight choreography and everything. Um, I thought they they did a really good job with that. Quarantino again, thank you so much. Uh, do you have much experience with filmmaking? So I am a videographer by trade. Um, I uh, went to school, um, uh, got my master's degree in digital storytelling. Um, so that's kind of you know that's basically a, a filmmaking it's like a fancy word for for video and film <laughs> or a fancy name that someone thought would be a good marketing <laughs> marketing degree for uh, ah, a good way to market a uh, a film degree i guess call it digital storytelling it sounds cutting edge or at least it did at the time that was an undisclosed number of years ago that would show my age um but yeah all that to say yes uh so i do have some experience with filmmaking, um, not so much films, the most, you know, I've, I've shot some, uh, cinematic music videos, um, would be the closest thing to actual films that I've done. Um, but I've been in the video slash, um, you know, filmmaking type realm, um, for the last 15 years or so. Uh, Shout out to Christopher, just subbed earlier this morning. Love the channel. Thanks so much, Christopher. Glad you found it. All right, let's take... <laughs> Kiro, yes. Second Valar video. I am still working on it. I apologize it's taken so long. It's been ridiculous, I know. 
I definitely owe you guys a uh, a Valar video. Um, Corey Irvine, congrats on 200K. By the way, your opinion on how Peter Jackson portrayed Thranduil? I thought it was fine. Yeah. Um, it it makes total sense for him to be kind of stuck up. Um, like, you know, especially knowing his father was kind of, you know, if you, so if you, uh, I did a whole video on, on, you know, the complete life of Thranduil and talk about his father or affair, um, or affair, um, kind of messes up big time in the war of the last Alliance. Like he doesn't want to follow the orders of Gilgalad, the high King of the Noldor. Um, so he, he kind of charges into battle before he's supposed to, and it gets, like over half of his army killed um, half of him, his army from Greenwood and uh, half the army from uh, what would later be called Lorien. Um, yeah. They get wiped out. That's where the dead marshes come from. It's the massacre there where a bunch of the elves were, were killed because Orifair didn't want to listen. Um, so yeah, it makes kind of, I kind of makes sense. I think Thranduil, makes sense to be kind of a jerk. Uh, wavy, uh, wavy rab five. <laughs> I love these usernames. Sometimes I don't even bother trying to pronounce them. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Would the third age have ended earlier if the one ring was destroyed at the end of the war of the last alliance? Would the third age have ended earlier? I don't know. Cause the ages are marked by, the significant events like big earth shattering events. So the end of the second age is when Sauron's defeated by the last Alliance when, you know, Sauron, his body is killed and Isildur cuts the ring from his hand. Um, and then the third age ends when the ring is destroyed. So if the ring gets destroyed, so I guess if Isildur throws the ring, in the fire, you know, when uh, Elrond says, destroy it, um, then, uh, then yeah, I don't know. I, that would still start the third age. So I don't know. Then it becomes like, okay, well, is there anything that comes after that? You know, um, if the ring's destroyed, then, you know, the biggest evil in the world is gone. So um, I don't know what, what would mark, you know, the third age. If anything, the third age might have gone on longer. All right. Um, yeah, let's take a um, another Patreon question. Uh, Angel asks, "How do you? How different do you think the Hobbit films would have been if Guillermo del Toro was able to direct the movie instead of Peter Jackson?" I think the uh, that's an interesting question. I, I definitely think it would have looked different. Um, it might have been jarring. Um, and I talk, I talked with, uh, Ian Nathan about this. So if you, if you're interested, you know, either on, uh, the podcast platforms or here on the channel, uh, you should listen to the Ian Nathan, uh, interview that I did. Um, he, uh, wrote a lot and had a lot of, um, experience on the set. Um, but he wrote, uh, the Peter Jackson biography. Um, it's called anything you can imagine. That's all about the middle earth films. Um, but we kind of talked about that, how, you know, Guillermo del Toro's Hobbit would not look like Peter Jackson's Hobbit. And that's part of the reason why Peter Jackson ran into so much trouble was because, you know, he had to start from scratch because he can't make a Guillermo del Toro movie, you know, so he couldn't just reuse all these designs when that's not the type of movie he would make. Um, I'm sure, you know, a good portion of the script would be the same, but as far as the, uh, effects and props like i could see some crazy looking orcs or like that spider scene like just thinking to things like pan's labyrinth that guillermo del toro has done like i can imagine the spider scene just being scary as heck <laughs> if if guillermo del toro did it like i could just see it just being creepy beyond all belief and it might not look very tolkien-esque honestly like it might but it would definitely look like Guillermo del Toro, I think. I would have loved to see it. Like, it would be cool if we could, uh, you know, Snyder cut the thing and 
get a Guillermo del Toro vision uh, version that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, all right. All right, we've got, uh, I'll do another Patreon one from Swagness. What was the opportunity cost of Eowyn participating in the Battle of Pelennor Fields? She was to stay in Rohan as the temporary ruler, was my understanding. Who was ruling Rohan in her absence? Did anything happen that she would be have been a part of? That's a good question. And kudos for using the term opportunity cost. That's one of my <laughs> favorite financial terms. It's what I... I teach that to my kids and like explain the concept at least, maybe not the words, but the concept of opportunity costs. Um, so if we've got Eowyn participating in the Battle of Pelennor Fields, we cannot also have her in Rohan. That is opportunity costs. There's your finance for the day. It works with money too. If you spend it on the illustrated edition of Unfinished Tales, then you can't spend it on the 4K set of Lord of the Rings. Opportunity cost. Um, I I don't think anything really happens back in Edoras when she's gone. Like by that point, you know, Saruman's army is destroyed. Um, the Dunlendings that were following Saruman are either killed or surrendered. I don't think there's any threats left there. Um that anything happened in Edoras. So, so yeah, she was more so, um, you know, she, she would basically become the queen because, uh, Theoden, you know, in that moment, he's thinking, uh, you know, I'm writing to my death. Like, you know, they, they know what they're writing to. And Aomer's going with him. Like that's his heir now is Aomer. So he's basically at that point, for all intents and purposes, like Eowyn is in line to be the queen. Like she's, she's in charge of what would remain of their people. If things should play out like they expect them to, and they're all wiped out at, uh, um, at Pelennor. So, yeah, but I don't think I, yeah, I don't know who would take over at that point. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, it's funny. Like, do you think they got back to Edoras and they're like, all right, you know, I can just imagine like, where they're like, okay, Eowyn, wh what should we do now? And then they're like looking around like, where's Eowyn? Shoot. What do we do now? And then they just, they just chill in Edoras. And then they all, you know, then Eomer and Eowyn end up coming back. So there you go. Another super chat from Jed Lee. Thank you so much, Jed. Appreciate it. All right. Let's see here. Where did the Dunlanders live? So they lived in Dunland, believe it or not. <laughs> um, yeah, so Dunland, um, let me see. I could pull out, I don't know if I can, if I can pull up a map here. All right. I get all these Lotro maps is what comes up. So Dunland is basically around the corner from Isengard. Here, let me. I should have. I don't know why I didn't have my map pulled up. Because, you know, the maps are kind of what I do a lot. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying to get it pulled up here. As I'm using this... Uh, New software here for my streams. Okay. So here we go. Dunland is right around here in Inithwaith. Orthanc 
is right down here. That's where Saruman lives. And right around the, basically right around the corner from him. And then the west fold of Rohan is this area right here. It's the west fold. So the Dunlendings would attack from here commonly before Saruman lives at Orthanc, actually. Going way back, we'll get into this in a future video, spoiler alert, that will be coming very soon, um, about Saruman moving into Orthanc. Um, but yeah, so there's the Dunland, where the Dunland, Dunlandings live. Yeah, if you have any other map questions, now I've got the map pulled up, I can, I can uh, bust out the map. Um, southern part of Arnor. What is the most southern part of Arnor? All right, so Arnor basically goes down to Miniriath right here. So Arnor, if you can track my little uh, magnifying glass here, Arnor comes up here. Let's see here. I can't remember if it cuts across here. I think it might go, yeah, I think it might cut across here. Um, it doesn't include Rivendell, obviously, but then it goes up over here and uh, most of Eriador. But Enethwaith, as I mentioned in my uh, Second Age map video, they do not fall under Arnor, but Miniriath does. So yeah, the su most southern part would be Miniriath here. All right. Do you know anything about an uprising in the east during the War of the Ring? I heard this but never found any sources. Cheers, mush. Um, I'm guessing that's in relation to the Blue Wizards. Um, you know, the, uh, the thought that they helped ensure that they, the um, um, forces of the East don't outnumber the West. Um, and we do know that not all the Easterlings were loyal to Sauron. That we know for sure. Um, so, yeah. So there could be, like I said earlier, I mean, heck, there could have been a, a civil war or something going on at the same time. We just don't know. Um, it's one of those things, um, you know, either Tolkien didn't get around to writing about or, you know, um, I mean, I'm sure if the, if the guy was an immortal elf, he probably would have just kept writing and we'd have, you know, just piles and piles of books which would be amazing by the way <laughs> but yeah it's hard to say all right <laughs> someone said they could see their house on the map um oh this is a good good question um just curious, why didn't many people live in the Third Age regions of Middle-earth while Beleriand existed? Um, so they actually, there were some that uh, that lived in those regions. It's just not talked about as much, and I think part of that is there's not as much conflict going on in those regions. Um, so going back to our trusty map, I really like this, having this accessible here. Um, so most of, middle, of what we know as Middle-earth from the Third Age is a forest during the first age. Um, so you've got, for one thing, Durin's folk. So these would be the dwarves that Thorin and uh, you know most of his people are descended from, Gimli's descended from. You know, the main dwarves that we know um, all live in this area. They never come into the first age at all. So over here in the Blue Mountains, that's where the a couple of the other um, groups of dwarves originate. And so they're the ones who come into play during the First Age in Beleriand, which, you know, on this map would be out here in the water. Um, but yeah, then you've I, you've got some elves, you know, you've got the, the elves that Thranduil and Orifair would rule over here in Rovanion. Um, sorry, there. Over here in Rovanion, um, they're there. During the first age, obviously the Ents are here, but they're also, you know, Treebeard talks about realms that are in Beleriand when he sings the song. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's still people and stuff going on during that time, but, um, we probably just don't hear as much about it because there's, uh, not the conflict that there is going on, um, in the, uh, in the first age in Beleriand. All right. Okay. Just making sure I didn't. Miss any super chats? I want to make sure I read out all the super chats. Um, I had another good question about ah yes, Atlas and Middle Earth. Stoketastic. I love that name, by the way. From Twitch. Again, from Twitch. Go to Nerd of the Rings One on Twitch. And in the future, I'll actually play video games because I understand that's what people do there. Um, in the Atlas of Middle Earth, does it have maps that show character movements, troops, and battles? I believe so. I think it does. We'll just find out right now. Um, yeah, so it does. So you can see here, hold it up. So there's an example that's got some, uh, some army movements. I know I saw one, I was doing some research earlier for like the Battle of Helm's Deep. Um, yeah, and it's got some really cool drawings. Like here's Minas Tirith. Um, it even has like the interior of the White Tower where it has like the throne room and the steward's chair here. Yeah, this is a really cool book. I would highly recommend it. Maybe I should do a future giveaway with this one. Um, yeah, it's a bit of an older book, but the Atlas of Middle Earth um, is a great book. You should totally check it out if you're interested. If you like my videos for the maps, um, that's... That's a great resource for me as well. Whenever I have doubts on, you know, if something's uh, coming from the east or west, I'll see if if I can uh, find a reference to it in there. It's super helpful. All right. Super chat from Armaniel. Thank you so much. Uh, cheers to your well-deserved 200K and more Middle Earth content to come. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, let's. Serpakia. Did anyone went to Amon by land in the first age? I don't think it makes reference to anyone going by land. I we know that the um, um you know the the uh, elves that are left behind by Feanor take the ice uh icy path to the north um by land to get to Beleriand, but i don't think it's ever referred to anybody going back that way i imagine passing it once the hell that's what it is um passing it once was probably enough and they were like uh nah like i know it's getting bad here in Beleriand, but it's it's cold if you're like me, I'm like, ugh, cold. I don't like it. <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> be like, yeah, Morgoth is destroying the world. It's like, maybe we should go back to Amon. Uh, it's really cold. That ice bridge is really cold. That's why they built boats. They're like, no, nah, we're not taking that ice bridge again. Shout out to Josh, became a YouTube member. Thank you so much, Josh. Be sure to go to the community tab and uh, get hooked up on our Discord. Um, all right. Uh, Kelly from uh, our Patreon Discord says, so I read the book long ago. My memory is foggy. Did all the elves die in the Battle of Helm's Deep? Good question. There are no elves at Helm's Deep. That is the answer. Um, that was created for the film for dramatic effect. Um, yeah, Haldir does not die in the books, so he probably got the the biggest, you know, short end of the stick kind of thing. Um, poor guy got killed off in the films. He wasn't even there in the books. Um, Berto Berg on Patreon asks, how far in the future do you already have videos planned? There seems to be an almost unlimited amount of material to discuss. Yeah, I do get asked all the time by friends who, uh, friends and family who've discovered that I do this, um, you know, they, they find out like, 
oh you do a youtube channel that's cool it's like yeah um it has two hundred thousand subscribers and then at that point they're like holy crap and then they get really interested <laughs> and then <laughs> they say are you gonna are you gonna run out of stuff like what did i'm like tolkien's world is so huge that is not even on my radar running out of stuff um as far as how far in advance i have videos planned i basically have a list of ideas that has only grown since i started this channel um so yeah i i kind of penciled them in probably about a month at a time or so um as has been already noted i've really failed on getting the second valar video done i still need to do that um so i was trying to do that as an additional into my uh in addition to like my regular weekly uh videos um so it was kind of trying to find time a week where i could produce two at once and i had tolkien reading day and then april fools back to back so uh it's been kind of hectic trying to plan ahead for those additional videos so i'm hoping to get to the valar one uh here really soon though uh, Jack G. Gollum knew the land. Why didn't he track Bilbo? Assuming this is possible, is the fear of confronting Smeagol past Smeagol's past greater than the pull of the ring? Um, as far as not tracking Bilbo, um, we actually discover that he uh, he waits a while before he leaves the mountains, like years. Um, so by the time excuse me, by the time he actually leaves the mountains, Bilbo's been to, uh, been to airborne back home already. Um, so he actually does track Bilbo for a while. He comes even as far as Lake town. And, uh, that's actually where, um, I was going to say that's where he learns the name shire is that right no maybe not no he learned some some piece of information when he's like overhearing people in lake town i can't recall what it is off the top of my head it's in my golem video if you watch my golem video i know i mentioned it in the golem video um but yeah so he does try to and then around the time that he's making his way back is when sauron reemerges in mordor which leads him to be pulled south to mordor um, so he never really makes it. And I know, I know, I think he, he like came to the, uh, at, at some point he comes to the, let's see here. That'd be West door, the door of Doran, but he can't figure out how to open it from the inside. So he's kind of trapped there. And then he ends up going South to Mordor instead. And that's when he gets captured. And then from that point, you know, we all know he, uh, ends up coming across the fellowship after that. Um, I don't know about the, the fear of his past greater than the pull of the ring. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good, uh, psychological question. <laughs> I don't know if I'm, <laughs> if I'm familiar enough with the psychology to answer that, but, um, yeah, the pull of the ring is pretty great though. We know that. Um, what sources for good Easterlings? I will have to look that up. Um, Yeah, I'll have to get back with you on that. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would say, I don't know if there's a source that says there's good ones, but they, I know that it's, they were not all loyal to Sauron. So like, I mean, it kind of leaves the door open. They could theoretically still be hostile to Gondor just because of old, um, you know, old hatreds or old uh, wars and stuff like that, you know. But, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it, it says somewhere that um, not all the Easterlings serve Sauron. All right. Oh, here's a good... I love Children of Horn questions. Okay. Stoktastic. I have not read Children of Horn yet, so forgive me if this is obvious, but is Horn still alive because of Morgoth's curse? Or was Huron released from the curse upon Morgoth's demise? Um, I think the curse still follows him. I think it says because he, uh, like the, um, I think it's part of the curse that, like 
leads him to bring the Nauglamir to Doriath, which ends up causing the fall of Doriath. It causes the death of King Thingol. Um, so I think it it still follows him. But yeah, I think he, at that point he's still alive just because, I mean, he's not like, you know, it's not like a a situation with a ring where it stretches your lifespan or anything like that. Like he's he could still feasibly be alive by his age at that point. All right. <laughs> Joshua's. Oh, okay. Because I I read your your comment from Patreon. Thanks so much for the super chat. Um, happy to know we're stacked on future com content yeah i'm not worried um about running out of stuff and plus we'll have the amazon show soon so we're gonna have stuff to talk about for sure ranger of the north where did you buy lord of the rings and hobbit 4k um so i was actually fortunate enough uh it was really cool warner brothers actually sent it to me to review on the channel um so that was pretty pretty awesome um but yeah i will uh you know, whoever wins the contest, I'm going to ship it to you from probably Amazon or something like that. But yeah, it's available at most retailers. So um, I did see someone earlier asked about the uh, like special collector's edition, ultimate edition, whatever it ends up get, getting called coming out this summer. Yeah. So there's the 4K edition, the, the copy that I'm giving away. And then later this summer, they're supposed to come out with an ultimate like Middle Earth set. And there's at least one particular bonus feature that we've not ever had before. So we don't we don't really know what that is. That's very mysterious, even on like the press release that they sent us with our review copies. Um, it didn't say. Um, I'm really crossing my fingers and hoping that it's uh, deleted scenes. Um, ideally, you know, deleted scenes that uh, Peter Jackson has done the full 4K restoration and like finished effects and everything i'd love to see like a finished polished whatever they had planned for uh faramir and aowen's wedding um yeah that'd be awesome i would also watch a six hour cut of return of the king or whatever whatever the original you know cut was because you know whatever cut we got there was probably a longer version even after the extended there was probably a longer version but i would watch it Naturi's Chill, thank you so much for the super chat. Do you have any content solely about Eru? And congratulations, Matt. I've been subscribed for nearly six months now, and seeing my loyalty badge change is very rewarding. Yeah, that's a fun, fun little perk. You get the uh, the loyalty badge as a member here on YouTube, and it uh, your emoji changes. I think, I think the last the last one you get is Tom Bombadil. Maybe I can't remember. They're all these little uh, Lord of the Rings emojis that I made back in the day. Um, yeah, I don't have any content solely on Eru. Um, he's kind of a mysterious figure. You know, he, he comes in at other people's stories really. So like we deal with him a lot in the first Morgoth video, um, during the creation and, uh, you know, he's the one that, you know, intervenes, um, to bring Gandalf back when he dies. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any currently anyway um but yeah i'll add that to my list to maybe uh look into the possibility of doing a full full eru video um yeah he's obviously a pretty important character <laughs> he's only the creator of the entire universe all right oh Okay. <clears throat> Michael Kenny, would you consider Santa Claus a Maya? Sure. I don't know. Um, yeah, Santa Claus doesn't come into play in Middle Earth. He does come into play in Narnia, though. And I kid you not, I, I showed my kids Narnia for the first time not too long ago. It was months ago, like in the middle of winter. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, uh, I even said like, because I, I just knew that they wouldn't um, think that I was being serious. I said, oh yeah, just wait till Santa Claus shows up. And they thought I was totally just goofing off. Um, 
But yeah, then Santa Claus showed up in Narnia because that's where Santa Claus likes to hang out, I guess. All right. Sorry, I'm looking through here. Notorious Chill, I didn't ignore you. I read you. Yeah, I just don't have anything on Eru. Not yet. Um, yeah, I'll definitely, like I said, I'll add it to the list, though. All right. Oh, maybe. <laughs> okay. I'm getting caught up. I'm realizing how far behind I am on the comments here. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple other asking if I if I'm worried I'll ever run out of content. Not not in the short term for sure. Not even in the long term. Ah, I did. Thank you, Garrett, for letting me know. I missed a couple. Um, Garrett, thank you so much for the super chat. Congrats on 200k. You should see my copy map book. You should see my copy map book. Now I'm curious. You should share share a picture on uh, on the Discord or something. All right, Sophia. Sorry, I skipped you there. My uh. My scrolly kind of freaks out from time to time. Uh, Sophia Linden, thank you so much. Do you think that after Dagger Daggerath, the elves are reborn with the past memories, or do they become new beings? Hmm. I think I would imagine they'd be reborn with past memories. Um, I don't, I'd have to look into it more with Glorfindel. He's one of the few that we know of that you know is reborn. And he actually comes back to Middle Earth. So he's like a unique circumstance. But I would imagine that he would have those previous memories. Um, I'll have to look into that more. But I would imagine they would be reborn with their past memories. Um, and the elves can be reborn anytime, really. Um, Glorfindel, the reason he's reborn so quickly is the nature of his death. Um, his He uh, self-sacrifice to save the survivors of, uh, the fall of Gondolin. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just most elves choose to stay in the undying lands rather than go back to middle earth, which who could blame them? I mean, middle earth has got nothing but trouble going on pretty much all the time. So. All right. Notorious Chill, I had a different question way before my question about Eru. It was about your opinion on Warcraft orcs and Lord of the Ring orcs. Oh, I'm sorry. Gosh. Okay. All right. I will find this question. Yeah. Um, Warcraft orcs. Sorry, I'm trying to find it here about the the Warcraft orcs. Just type it in the regular chat. I'll I'll make sure I I catch it here about the the Warcraft orcs. Um, I I haven't seen the the Warcraft movie. Um, yeah, I I I know the orcs. They're they're like huge and they have the big fangs and stuff like that. Um. Oh, we had a, uh, let's see here. There we go. Ranger of the North. Do you think that if Jackson decides to make the Silmarillion, could that be as great as Lord of the Rings or it would be like Hobbit? Um, well, first of all, like, it's not up to Jackson if he makes the Silmarillion. It's up to, like, the Tolkien estate and who they give the rights to and all that stuff. Um, the Silmarillion is packed with potential for sure. Like, it could be every bit as epic, if not more epic, than Lord of the Rings in some ways. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's full of potential. I really think like, I don't think Peter Jackson deserves the flack that he gets for the Hobbit. Like he was kind of handed a, a rough, uh, he was given a rough hand with, uh, 
the short timeline that he was working on as, you know, as someone I mentioned, you know, I work in video and have done, uh, you know, music video, cinematic music videos and stuff like that. And it's like the difference between having proper pre-production time and not is huge. Um, so I have great sympathy for, you know, the fact that he was kind of thrown into that situation. They should have just delayed. Honestly, they should have delayed the movies, but that would cost them money. So, uh, okay. Oh, wow. We're already okay. It's already 550. Okay, so we're going to wrap this up in 10 minutes. Just FYI. Um, I've got some stuff I need to do yet today. And I got to get work on Saturday's video. Uh, J rock asks, are there other, other fantasy series that you like? Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy Harry Potter. Um, the audiobooks, especially, uh, narrated by Jim Dale are really good. I'm a big fan of those. Um, star Wars. I'm a big star Wars fan. That was actually like my first, um, kind of nerdy fandom. I guess, um, you know, I was probably like seven or eight, you know, like most most kids around my age saw it on VHS uh, back in the day. Um, so, yeah, I've I've got a lot of opinions when it comes to Star Wars and uh, um, probably not as passionate of feelings. But like, you know, I, I pay attention to like Harry Potter, you know, with the, the Fantastic Beast movies that are like. Um, so I've got. I've got opinions on those, but, uh, but yeah, I, I really like star Wars and, uh, the Harry Potter, uh, franchise as well. So those would probably be the other, uh, two big ones. All right. Into the wardrobe. Shout out to into the wardrobe. One of our, uh, newer channels that joined on our uh, Tolkien Reading Day collaboration. That's an entirely Narnia channel, kind of like mine, but with Narnia. So if you like Narnia, you should go subscribe to Into the Wardrobe. Uh, what's something you've learned during the production of your videos that has surprised you? Hmm. Man, that is a really good question. Um, hmm. That's a tough one. Like I haven't I haven't had any anything recently that's really like been earth shattering. Um I'd say it's a, a lot of it comes down to the minor characters and how much detail I'm able to find on minor characters. Um you know, you think of of characters who only pop up uh you know, their names mentioned like a couple times or something. You know, I think of uh Oh, one good example uh, recently was Baragond. The uh, he's totally cut out of the film. So, like, I I had even like kind of forgotten about him a little bit um, until I was researching my video on Faramir, and then I'm like, oh yeah, this whole other guy that I really liked in the books. Um, but he's super loyal to Faramir. He's actually probably you know uh, close to, if not equal, equally as responsible for saving Faramir as. Pippin is. Um, and yeah, he's totally cut out. But yeah, just discovering background information about minor characters and how much detail Tolkien goes into. I'm always in awe of that. JH asks, have you seen Lily Lindsay Ellis's videos on The Hobbit? Yes, I have. Um, yeah, I've seen all, all three parts. It's been a while since I've watched them. Um, but yes, I have. They're, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it, like I said, it's been a really long time since I watched them. So I, I can't remember offhand. I know that I, I remember the third part going into like the finances and stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I can't make any specific comments just cause I can't really remember for sure what, what all was said in it. I know they're, they're really well made. Um, Notorious Chill, have you ever watched Dark Crystal series on Netflix? It's so good. I have not. I haven't. I think that was, was that a movie back in the day that it's now a sequel to or something? 
maybe? I haven't seen either. But I will put it on my queue, or my list, my watch list. It used to be Q back in the day, showing again how old I am, back when you got DVDs mailed to you. Yeah, I'm old, guys. <laughs> Please sing something like Tom... <laughs> I'm guessing it wasn't Tom Bomb Adolf <laughs> that you meant to type. Tom Bombadil? <laughs> Man, you did a super chat and everything. Now I feel compelled. I could at least give you a couple lines. I don't I don't know any of it off the top of my head. Um but yeah, Tom, you know, we were talking about voices earlier with like Morgoth and Smaug. And then we've got Tom. He's like a jolly, I think of him like a Santa Claus almost, like a a more uh Rural Santa Claus. Rural Santa Claus is kind of what I go for with Tom. And it's like, it's like, oh, little hobbit. Eh? <laughs> let me say, let me, let me try. Okay. Yes. Tom Bombadil. You say, uh, okay. Okay. So Tom, he's like, he's like, uh, Hey, doll, merry doll, ring a dong, dillo. That's all I got for you. I don't remember the rest of the song. I know bright blue his jacket is and his boots are yellow. So there you go. <laughs> Good old Tom. Uh, do, 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 do. Have you watched Ralph Bakshi's animated Lord of the Rings? I think it's fantastic. It has, let's say, that magic that books have. Yes, I have. I have watched it. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting. It's definitely made in a very specific time. You know, it's got the rotoscoping where you, for those of you who aren't familiar with the film, uh, um, uh, film terminology of rotoscoping, it's where they like film live actors and then they draw over it. So that's like those scenes where it's like, okay, this is definitely not a cartoon. Um, so it's got that, which at certain times works really well. Like, I feel like there's parts with the Nazgul that it's like, yeah, this gives a creepy vibe. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely dated. It's not going to hold up like, uh, you know, Peter Jackson's films. Um, I feel like those films are going to be about as close to timeless as anything, you know, produced in my lifetime. Um, but yeah, I mean, there it's definitely, you know, uh, I I definitely wouldn't agree, you know, that they're better than that. It's better than Peter Jackson's or anything like that. Um, but yeah, you should totally, uh, totally check it out if you haven't. Um, Kiro asks, have you listened to any of the audiobooks? I've listened to basically all of the audiobooks. <laughs> um, so I have a video on my channel. You should check it out. It's a breakdown of all the Tolkien audiobooks. Um, and I kind of give little mini reviews, you know, just kind of saying uh, um, what, you know, each one consists of and, uh, you know, what uh, what each one is and like how how good it is, that kind of thing. You know, m mini review, I guess. Um, the only caveat there is like th I made that video before we got a Fall of Gondolin audiobook and before we got the Andy Circus Hobbit audiobook. So. I would bump up the Andy Circus Hobbit audiobook is definitely my favorite version of the the Hobbit audiobook. Um, all right. Well, we are just about out of time. So once again, I will just first of all thank you to everyone who's uh, stayed in here on the um, chat and joined us for a live stream. This was fun. Um, I like doing these every once in a while where we just kind of. Uh, talk and chill out. Um, I'll get the the code up here in just a second. Um, so again, like I said, I'm also streaming this on Twitch. So if you um, are on Twitch at all, be sure to uh, go subscribe or follow me there. I'm still working out the terminology. Um, but yeah, it's Nerd of the Rings 1 on Twitch. And so that's where I'm probably going to do gaming stuff from here on out. And I'll keep the lore stuff here on this channel. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, da -da -da -da. 
I'll take one more question. Uh, so here from Twitch, what's the difference between what's written in the Silmarillion and the new novels edited by Christopher Tolkien? So the Silmarillion is actually also edited by Christopher Tolkien. Um, after The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, that was the only works published during J.R.R. Tolkien's lifetime. Um, his son Christopher edited and did everything else completely on his own. Um, so, yeah. So The Silmarillion was edited by uh, Christopher Tolkien, but it doesn't have like the commentary uh, that like Fall of Gondolin and Baron and Luthien have in between where he kind of explains how the story came together and like the manuscripts he was working with. Um, but yeah, the Silmarillion, you know, that's like the, the cool thing about Christopher Tolkien is like, he doesn't make stuff up, you know, on his own. It's all, all his dad's stuff. So, um, Paul Martin, thank you so much, man. I'm not going to log off after that, man. Okay. Paul Martin. Hello. Thank you for all the work you do for Lord of the Rings. You have helped me understand Lord of the Rings lore more with your videos. Have a good day. Thank you, Paul. 99.99. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Man, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm glad that the people seem to really enjoy the channel. Um, yeah, it's, it's gone beyond anything that I expected it to, uh, starting out. Um, I really, you know, thought if I could get to monetization you know in a year i'd be doing pretty good so yeah and then uh for it for it to take off the way it has i got this the silver play button back here that you know every once in a while i peek back at it and i'm like holy crap i have a silver play button this is wild um so <laughs> yeah so thank you so much everybody for uh um for being here on the chat and uh you know watching the videos sharing the videos um again Okay, so we, we've got the giveaway. It's in the description. If you haven't already, make sure you enter it. Once again, I will bring up another bonus code for you. NOTR bonus, Nerd of the Rings bonus. That'll give you another 10 entries into the giveaway with some awesome books and prizes. So we'll have that. Um, yeah, I, that will end on Monday. So on Tuesday, we'll announce the winners for that. Um, yeah, and it'll be fun. And also be sure that you subscribe and tune in for um, Saturday's video because there will be a code that will pop up on screen during Saturday's video um, that will also give you another 10 entries. So that'll be kind of your last chance to get in before Monday's deadline. Uh, with any bonus entries, unless who knows, maybe I'll throw another one out on uh, Twitter or Instagram or something like that. I could always make more, get you some more bonus entries. Um, ah, can't seem to enter another bonus. Okay. Um, I will take care of that. Let me, I, I've just got to go on and add more fields for you to, to enter a bonus code, I believe. Okay. I will fix that right after I end the stream here. So make sure you keep keep the code. I will enter that in as a second line. So there'll be a second opportunity to uh, enter a bonus code on there. Um, I might even be able to do it. Let's see here. If I've got it pulled up, I'll do it right here. So let's see here. This is what happens when you use new software. All right. All right, we'll do another, we might as well, I could, I could probably answer another question while I'm doing this. <laughs> okay. So it's telling you that you can't do two bonus codes. Is that right? Did Legolas get married? Did he have any kids? Um, no, not that we know of. He was probably just, uh, you know, the uh, he probably got voted most eligible bachelor, that kind of thing, because of his dreamy hair. All right. 
Okay. Well, I will get this sorted out, guys. Um, so keep uh, keep a hold on that uh, code, Nerd of the Rings bonus, and I will get that fixed as soon as I log off here. Um, but thank you once again for uh, hopping on and uh, being on the stream today. Thank you for subscribing and for watching the channel. I appreciate it so much. And uh, I hope to do this again when we hit another, um, who knows, maybe another 100,000 subscribers or something. We get to 300,000, we'll do this again. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.